at the outset, I must thank uh, Minalda, Professor M. K. Roy, for his very kind invite in this August gathering. I propose to talk on cardioembolic stroke. I'll give a brief overview. Um, if we look uh, at the different categories of stroke, lacunar thrombotic strokes are the one where we have a thrombosis in the penetrating blood vessels and they get a small infarcts, subcortical small infarcts, mainly located around basal ganglia. Then there can be atherothromboembolic stroke where the clot is formed in the carotid or vertebral arteries or in the intracranial large vessels and then from there an uh, embolus appears and blocks the vessels. So it's an atherothromboembolic stroke. And there's a third type where the clot may arise from the chambers of the heart and they go into the brain, that is cardioembolic stroke. Now, lacuna stroke account for 37% of all the ischemic strokes. The cardioembolic are 22%, the large vessel atherosclerosis is 31%, and this is the miscellaneous group. Now, what are the causes of cardioembolic stroke? This is a long list, but the most important cause for cardioembolic stroke is atrial fibrillation, followed by cardiac failure. And then there are other diseases. This is very, very important in our country, even now, this rheumatic valvular heart disease. Then we have endo infective endocarditis, bacterial or non-bacterial, atrial septal aneurysm with or without ASD or PFO, uh, postmyocardial infarction, prosthetic heart, heart valves, atrial myxomas. So these are uh, the causes for cardioembolic strokes. But as I said, the most important cause for cardioembolic stroke is atrial fibrillation. And here, the clot originates in the left atrium. And from there, it is thrown out in the circulation and goes to the brain. Now, if there is mitral valvular disease, hypertension, diabetes, left ventricular dysfunction associated with atrial fibrillation, then the risk of cardioembolic stroke increases many fold. But one must keep it in mind that if you have a atrial fibrillation and if you have a patient that individually is ischemic stroke, not always it is cardioembolic stroke. There can be other types of stroke associated with it. 65% of stroke in atrial fibrillation cases is cardioembolic stroke. Rest are, could be lacunar or atherothromboembolic strokes. Cardiac failure either due to myocardial infarction or cardiomyopathy, ranks second after, atrial, fi um, after um, atrial fibrillation as risk factor for cardioembolic stroke. Now, when you get a, a cardiomyopathy or acute myocardial infarction, here the clot originates in the ventricles, and there it is thrown out, in contrast to low atrial fibrillation where the clot appears in the atrial uh, chamber. So rheumatic valvular disease, as I said, is still a very important cause of cardioembolic stroke in our country. And here, mitral valve disease, particularly mitral stenosis, is more important for cardioembolic stroke than the aortic valve disease. If we have mitral stenosis associated with atrial fibrillation, the risk of cardioembolic stroke is very, very high. Now, if we have an atrial septal aneurysm, the aneurysm actually moves um, from side to side and from the neck of the aneurysm the clot is formed and from there cardioembolic stroke can happen. If you have atrial septal aneurysm associated with atrial septal defect or patent foramen ovale, then the cardioembolic stroke can be more prevalent and there may be right to left shunt. The paradoxical embolism can happen. Infective endocarditis can happen in the background of rheumatic valvular disease or in IV drug abusers, those who have prosthetic valves or endovascular procedures. Here, the vegetations are located in the mitral valves usually, and if the vegetations are more than one centimeter in size, there's a very high risk of developing cardioembolic stroke. But there are rare cases where there's non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis or what we call marantic thrombus. And that happens in the backdrop of malignant conditions, systemic vasculitis, bone marrow transplant, or in SLE. SLE, we have a fancy name, 
we call it Lippmann Sachs endocarditis. So here you see, of all the cardioembolic strokes, non-valvular atrial fibrillation related cardioembolic stroke is in 50% of the cases, acute myocardial infarction in 10%, then in cardiomyopathy another 10%, the other sources like PFO, ASA, atrial septal defect, this thing uh, can account for 15% of cardioembolic stroke, prosthetic valves 5%, and valvular heart disease globally is 10%, but in our country, still rheumatic valvular heart disease related cardiomolic stroke probably has a higher prevalence rate. So if you think or suspect this is a case of cardioembolic stroke, then you can go for certain investigations. Now you can get a clue that it could be a cardioembolic stroke from the MRI scan. MRI scan, although they are usually a large cortical infarct, a single infarct, but if you get several infarcts, you know, on both sides of the hemisphere with large infarcts with a V-shape and the base of the triangular V-shape is towards the cortex, these are very characteristic of cardioembolic stroke. But generally speaking, we do get cardioembolic stroke, which are large single cortical infarcts. And they are very prone to undergo hemorrhagic transformation. Now the investigations that are focused on cardiac investigations related to the stroke, we do electrocardiography, serial ECG, cardiac telemetry, if we have a high index of suspicion, we can go for extended cardiac monitoring with loop recorder, echocardiography, particularly transesophageal echocardiography has an edge over transthoracic because you see the valves, the patent foramen ovale and intracardiac mass much better with the transesophageal echocardiography. Now, what about the treatment of therapy for cardioembolic stroke? For primary and secondary prevention, the mainstay is oral anticoagulation, and that must be emphasized because if we compare the activity or efficacy of oral anticoagulant uh, with aspirin, the vitamin K antagonist, one of the prototype is warfarin, that can reduce the risk of stroke by up to 68%. In contrast, aspirin is substantially less effective, it's 21%. We have encountered many cases of ischemic stroke treated on aspirin who have developed recurrent stroke and when investigated uh, intensively found they are actually cardioembolic stroke and the patient should be put on oral anticoagulant. So if we use Vitamin K antagonist, the aim is to keep the internationalized normalized ratio between 2 and 3. And that has to be ensured by regular monitoring of blood. Because this is the window area between 2 and 3, the international normalized ratio has to be kept if we give oral anticoagulation. If it is less than 2, there is a high chance of developing recurrent uh, strokes, cardioembolic ischemic strokes. If it goes beyond three, there is a high chance of developing cerebral hemorrhage. So it's a two-way sword. But one good thing is now, in non-valvular atrial fibrillation, we can use the novel oral anticoagulant, what we call NOAX, instead of vitamin K antagonist. And because if you give NOAX, we don't have to bother about regular monitoring of, with INR, and doesn't have that kind of drug interaction with other drugs or food. Now the oral, novel oral anticoagulants that we have at the moment are either factor 10A inhibitors, namely apixaban, rivaroxaban, edoxaban, and there can be direct thrombin inhibitor like the bigatran. Now several studies have shown with all the individual um, novel anticoagulant that their efficacy in non-valvulate fibrillation is similar. Sometimes it may be a little bit better than the vitamin K antagonist. And the good thing is they have a much less chance of developing cerebral hemorrhage, which is, always, which is always a threat if you use the vitamin K antagonist. But uh, the point is, if somebody has a very advanced renal disease, we cannot give this NOAX. We have to then resort to vitamin K antagonist. Now, if we add aspirin with vitamin K antagonist, it increases the bleeding risk. And there is no clear benefit if we add that. 
So therefore, if you give oral anticoagulant, just stick to oral anticoagulant only. Don't add aspirin to it. Now, suppose in a cardiomolic stroke, the anti oral anticoagulant is contraindicated due to various reasons. What should you give? Studies have shown that if you give dual antiplatelets, aspirin plus clopidogrel, it is slightly better. But that betterment is offset by there is an increased risk of major bleeding. Therefore, the guidelines recommend that if absolutely contraindicated oral anticoagulation is there, then stick to aspirin only. Now, this is a very important um, slide in the sense that the, when do you start oral anticoagulant after the patient has an acute ischemic stroke? Now, here it shows that if somebody has an acute ischemic stroke, the cardiomolic stroke, within the first 48 hours of stroke, there is a high risk of recurrent thromboembolic event of 4.8%. During that period of 48 hours, if um, there is also a very high risk of hemorrhagic transformation, in fact, there's a higher risk of 9%. So that has to be factored in in our timing of adding an oral anticoagulant. So the thing is, for the first three days of acute cardiomolic stroke, please don't start oral anticoagulation because there is an extremely high risk of hemorrhagic transformation. Already there is a risk of hemorrhagic transformation. You are adding to that risk. So generally speaking, if we use um, the vitamin K antagonist, that should be started between 4 to 14 days after the onset of ischemic cardioembolic stroke. In a very mild case, a small tiny cortical infarct is there, cardioembolic. You can start on the fourth day. But it's a large disabling uh, cardioembolic stroke. You should start oral anticoagulation after 14 days. So what will you give in these 14 days? Give aspirin only. The people have tried giving low molecular weight heparin to bridge that period, but it has been found that it doesn't increase um, the prevention rate of is further ischemic stroke. Furthermore, it can lead to more hemorrhagic transformation. So stick to aspirin in all these days. Now this is, after the NOACs have come, we call it the Dinner's rule. Uh, Dinner has shown that if we initiate NOACs after a cardioembolic stroke because of non valvular atrial fibrillation, then you take this 1, 3, 6, 12 day rule. If it is a TIA, you can start NOAC with atrial fibrillation, you can start NOACs on day one. And then, depending upon the severity of the ischemic stroke, you can initiate uh, NOAC on third, sixth, or twelfth day. If the underlying cause is a mechanical prosthetic valve, then it requires lifelong vitamin K antagonist. And here the INR should be kept a little bit on the higher side between 2.5 to 3. And you also have to add aspirin along with vitamin K antagonist. NOACs are not recommended in mechanical prosthetic valves. If you have a bioprosthetic valve, the vitamin K antagonist is recommended in the first three months and INR should be kept around 2.5. After three months, aspirin alone to be continued lifelong. If you have endocarditis, and that is the cause of cardioembolic stroke, then antibiotics is the foundation of treating the patients. You should not use either antiplatelet or anticoagulant because there is an extremely high risk of developing intracerebral hemorrhage. So the treatment is antibiotics and antibiotics here. If it's a non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, the treatment is lifelong low molecular weight heparin instead of VKA. If you have atrial myxoma or other intracardiac mass leading to recurrent CS, the only way to deal with this is surgical resection of the mass. Now, can we give IV thrombolysis in acute ischemic period if they come within the window period? Yes, you can, and the data has shown a very high uh, uh, recovery prognosis. Even if it's a cardioembolic stroke, you can use IV thrombolysis or mechanical thrombotomy if the patient comes within the appropriate time window. So I conclude here.
cardioembolic stroke is still an underdiagnosed disease in our country. If you get a stroke, please explore to see the underlying cause. And many of these cases of stroke is because of cardioembolic stroke. And because if, do, if you don't give oral anticoagulant timely, they might go into recurrent strokes. And they're usually very severe strokes. So oral anticoagulant is the mainstay of treatment in primary and secondary prevention of CES. You have to figure out the underlying etiology in cardiomolic stroke to administer the right choice of anticoagulant, either VKA or NOAX. And proper use of oral anticoagulant is absolutely necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Uh, the session is now open for questions and comments. Yeah, thank you, Tabuzza, for a nice elaboration. Uh, I just want to clarify one thing that uh, when uh, we are giving uh, this uh, uh, VKA or oral anticoagulant for uh, non-valvular uh, atrial fibrillation, so some patients uh, sometimes takes aspirin for other reasons like cardiac cause or like that or even the, uh, for past history of uh, some uh, lacunar impact. So if we give uh, VKA, should we stop aspirin altogether? Because you know the, it acts on, it is antiplatelet, and this is actually yeah. uh, oral anticoagulant. Yeah. So I mean, basically, in generally speaking, you should stop. Unless the patient has an acute coronary syndrome, where you have to add aspirin. If the patient has put on stent, then for the first few months, you have to give dual antiplatelets. Other than that, you should only stick to oral anticoagulant because data has shown the chance of hemorrhage becomes very high if you add the two. And the second uh, question is that, you know, sometimes I face few patients, particularly elderly, uh, who has got a uh, unknown mitral stenosis which was discovered during our investigation and they have got atrial fibrillation. So when we try to put uh, them on this VKA, uh, because, you know, a patient has got mitral stenosis, they, they develop severe bleeding. So the, in that case, I was uh, searching the literature. We, we got few cases of uh, uh, valvular heart lesions with atrial fibrillation. They have tried NOAC. So is there any guideline or is there any recommendation or it is just off-level? Yeah, it. it's pretty much off-level. The data has said with valvular lesion, no. But again, you, are, you know, there is a catch here. If you have a mitral valvular stenosis of critical amount, then it is valvular stenosis, I mean valvular disease plus atrial fibrillation. If it is a non-critical mild mitral stenosis, it is not of no value actually. They, those things we don't consider. It can be treated as non-valvular atrial fibrillation as well. Sir, I, excellent deliberation. Thank you, sir. Uh, so what uh, my knowledge goes that in valvular heart disease like MR, that could be non-rheumatic mitral regurgitation. In that, in those cases, we can use NOAC. One. Yeah, and then again, I mean, when you say valvular heart disease, we have to address the critical or uh, severity of valvular heart disease. A very mild incidental finding of mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation is not uncommon nowadays with doing the echocardiography, and those are treated as non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And so if it's a criticality yes. of the valvular heart disease, which is of importance here. Yeah. And answer, when anticoagulant could not be used for any reason, what to prevent cardioembolic uh, stroke, what should be the dose of aspirin? Is it double the conventional dose, 75, that is 150 milligrams? That, I don't think that has been actually um, uh, prescribed in any of the studies. They say use aspirin if um, oral anticoagulant is Absolutely contraindicated. Okay, there is no. Uh, if there are no more questions, thank you. Thank you.